finding the gospel in something as trivial, something as, as, as silly as pop culture, well, stranger things have happened. Let's talk about it with Dr. Michael S. Heiser on Steve Brown, etc. He's, he's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Sarah. This is Steve Brown, etc. I am Matthew Porter. I am not the old white guy. Uh, I am pinch hitting today for the old white guy. Uh, I want to. I want to reflexively say I'm the young white guy, but that's not. <laughs> that's <laughs> I think not even, Zach has his beak. That's not even close. I have. I looked in the bathroom mirror this morning, and I have empirical evidence that I'm, I'm clearly not. You're not a young kid anymore. I, uh, I, I'm. I, I'm your rodeo clown for today. Can we yeah. just? We'll just run with that. The getting older white guy. Yes. I'm <laughs> moving towards being the old white guy. The the true uh, young white guy is our favorite resident megachurch pastor, <laughs> Zach Van Dyke. Yes. I'm not that young either, man. I'm I'm close to 40. It's relative. <laughs> six kids will do that. Uh, yeah. You yeah, six old kids. Man. Six kids will make you old fast, man. So speaking of the six kids, we just got past Thanksgiving. So tell me. Uh, over Thanksgiving, did you guys consume more turkey and stuffing or more Disney Plus? We uh, probably Disney Plus because yeah. I, I made the turkey for the first time ever, and it was okay. Nice. I did okay. Did you stuff it? I, I yeah, and I pulled all the. I don't know why they leave the stuff inside it yeah. to <laughs> separate the amateurs from the <laughs> pros. Right. It was not fun. It was not. So fun. I got the bag out, but the neck. And the uh, other thing, whatever yeah. that is, yeah, that uh, that smoked right inside the bird. I've been there. I've done that too. That was. It doesn't come out at the end either. It's tough. <laughs> that was our head turkey chef slash producer, Jinx. He's working hard in the little glass booth. Since we're talking about uh, TV shows today and pop culture, Jinx, do you have a favorite TV show? Favorite? Or uh, top I ten? I don't know. You know, anything along the lines of Burn Notice. That's probably yeah. the one that sticks. <laughs> That's just really good, and I like that actor. Nice. Excellent. Uh, Mr. John Myers is working in the tech bunker. He is our video director. He's, He's switching. TV. Well, I asked him ahead of time. He said, we're going to talk about TV stuff. John, what's, a, what's your favorite TV show? He actually said, uh, My Little Pony, uh, <laughs> Friendship is Magic. And I thought, well... Bold choice for a grown man, but I support you. I'm, I'm, I'm Brony here. Con 2020. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> Dr. George Bingham is here. He's the president of Key Life. I, I don't know your favorite TV show. I want you to tell me, but I want to intuit kind of. I feel like I want to. I know this is not right, but I want to see Grizzly Adams. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. the beard, the, the um, rugged. Well, uh, <laughs> serving as the uh, uh, you know old white guy. Stand in yes. or whatever Interim. for the day. Yeah. yeah, right. No, actually, I like reruns of Last Man Standing. Okay, that's that. That is a good one. Yeah, it has some good. I like. I like the political stuff. I can't believe I, they get away with it. Yeah. I thought you were going to say reruns of Seinfeld. No. Ooh, that's oh. a good one too. no. How could you not like Seinfeld? Yeah. yeah. Not that there's wait, anything wrong with wait, it. Wait, wait a second. Was was that your Jerry Seinfeld? That was pretty, pretty <laughs> weak. Okay, I just wanted to make we'll sure. Fix I that was, post. <laughs> Please do, because of all the easy to do. Uh, all right. Moving on. Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program, as you well know. Now, again, I don't know your favorite TV show. I, I want to guess that it would involve the words bake off. Or championship or ultimate, anything? Nailed or, no. it. Or is it Miami Vice? It's, no, it's Game of Thrones. Miami Vice. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with baking because I'm terribly intimidated by all those people that really know what they're doing in the kitchen. So. Oh, then you haven't seen Nailed It. Ugh. Oh, probably not. Watch that and you'll feel better. That's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, here's Wait, a guy who nailed it. She didn't say though. What? What, what is, is it? I, I, I'm well, I it's I, I don't even know because I mean it doesn't have anything to do with the moniker that. Yes. You know, gets hung on me all the time about the baking thing. Oh, wow. So. You're so much more than that. You're 31 yeah, flavors and then you. some. Yeah, exactly. Me and mm -hmm. Howard Johnson's. You don't know me. And Baskin <laughs> Robbins. Yeah. Awesome. Well, one of the favorite TV shows of uh, today's guest is a Netflix show called Stranger Things. Our guest is Dr. Michael S. Heiser. He is a biblical scholar. He's an author, blogger, and podcaster. He's written 
numerous best-selling books, including The Unseen Realm, Supernatural, and The Bible Unfiltered. Michael serves as the executive director of the School of Technology at Celebration Church, and his latest book <laughs> is titled The World Turned Upside Down, Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things. Uh, welcome, Michael. First thing I have to say is this, this, Thank book, you. this book design, absolutely fantastic. It forces Yeah, they you. did a nice job with it. I I think it's the best. You guys got to check this out. So welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I need to correct one quick correction. I'm not the executive director of the School of Technology. Okay. That would that would horrify my current employer. Okay. <laughs> it's the School correct of us. Theology. Yeah. School of Theology. Excellent. Yeah. Hey, listen, one correction. I'm not gonna, the place is going to burn letters. down anytime soon. If we're only at one correction so far, we're doing way better than I expected. So We are ahead of the curve. Ahead of the curve. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it starts with the same letters. It starts with the same letters. <laughs> I was wondering what kind of church had a school of technology that was fascinating. Yeah. I thought Who's that was, your head that writer, Matthew? Really cool. I don't know, but <laughs> he's getting really he's cool getting fired. <laughs> so when the network goes down, that's what I'll tell them. Nice. Right. So around the table, we have a split between folks who know and love the show and folks who will soon know and love the show. Uh, so to set the table for us, uh, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about the Stranger Things series, what it's about, what's the mm -hmm. vibe of this thing? Yeah, this the show is set in a small town, Hawkins, Indiana, in 1983. And the show opens with four kids, they're middle schoolers, playing Dungeons and Dragons. And it's dark now, so we've got to get on our bikes and ride home. And, you know, my kids asked me, was there really a time when you when you like did that, <laughs> you know, when you just rode wow. around on your bikes and you, yeah, that's the way we grew up. You yeah. know? Does seem so they, they, on the, on the way home, one of these kids gets abducted and we know as the viewer that there's something otherworldly behind this disappearance, the vanishing of Will Byers. And so that sets the tone for the show. There's something otherworldly, the show's version of a supernatural reality, a reality beyond our own. It's these kids. It's what happened to Will. And as, as his friends in the, at the end of the first episode are out looking in the woods, trying to retrace their friend's steps, they encounter a girl in the woods, their same age, again, middle schooler. She's wearing nothing but a hospital gown. Her head is shaved. She can barely speak and communicate when they bring her home. And so you, the viewer, it sort of intuitively know that there's some relationship here between the disappearance of the boy and this really out of place girl, again, in the middle of the woods, soaking wet in the rain. And that those two things drive the show. What happened to Will and what is going on with this girl who we later you know, identify as 11? She does not have a name, but she has a tattoo with the number 11. And so... That's, you know, sort of the guts of the show. You're introduced to the two main trajectories, you know, uh, really the three main trajectories, these two kids and then this otherworldly reality that is behind the whole, you know, all the currents of the show. So that you're, you're just drawn in right away. It, it's brilliant because the main characters are kids. So it gets that demographic. Mm. And everything is in the 80s. So the kids' parents <laughs> just mm -hmm. get sucked into the show, too. And the attention to detail is just quite remarkable uh, throughout the whole thing. That's awesome. Yeah, they certainly set the hook within five minutes. I'd say ten, give it 10 yep. minutes. If, if, you're not, if you're not captured by then, it's not going to be for you. They really do draw you in. So we'll, we'll get into the specifics of, of these parallels that you, um, that you lay out in the book. But uh, I'm curious, what... Uh, what about the series is it specifically, and you talk about this in the book, that, that drew you, that kind of captured your attention? And, and when mm -hmm. was that moment when you're watching it going, this is a book. i got to write a book about this. Well, you know, the, the book wasn't my idea. That I mean, the, the, the people at Lexham, you know, I had my bread and butter as an academic is the, the supernatural worldview of the Bible. So they knew that, and they knew I loved the show, and so they, to them this was the perfect marriage. And when they proposed the idea, I said, "Yeah, you know that that's really an excellent idea because I saw, and these, this isn't a the book isn't like oh here's this part of this scene that's part of the story over here and in, in you know this part of the Bible. It's not. It's a whole lot deeper than that. 
there are a lot of theological themes that run through the show. Uh, you know, I think unbeknownst to the show's creators, it just tracks so well. So I could see the idea mattering right away. And, and, and for me, the show, I was drawn in, like you said, by the first episode. I, I was interested in what they were going to do with what becomes known as the upside down, this alternate reality. And of course, the girl, like what in the world's going on here? Uh, very intriguing. But I think better than that, you know, more than that, if the show does get people because, you know, of the attention to detail with the 80s. So there's a nostalgia effect. There's this, there's this supernatural effect because most of the people in our, our time, they are dissatisfied with the materialistic, atheistic, this is all there is. The only thing that's real is what you can, you know, detect with your five senses worldview. They're just dissatisfied with it. It doesn't answer the big questions of life. People want to believe that there's something transcendent outside themselves, that that is this this other reality. They they want mystery. And so the show just taps into that really well. And I think that the, the other thing that draws people in is the characters, because they're all broken. They're all they all have attachment issues. And we you can it's easy to see yourself in any one of them. That's mm. awesome. We're going to talk about that more when we come back. Our author guest is Michael S. Heiser. The book is called The World Turned Upside Down, Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Will Byers character. As we mentioned in the very first ep- uh, sub- episode, he, t- he disappears just like my capacity for speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and... He disappears into this alternate realm, and it sounds fantastic, but Michael says there's something very relevant to us as believers about that. What does he mean by that? We will find out on the other side. listening to Steve Brown, etc. It was recently announced that there will be a fourth season of Stranger Things in late 2020, and I would guess that no mm. one is more excited about that announcement than our guest today, Dr. Michael S. Heiser, because uh, his newest book is called The World Turned Upside Down, Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things. So, hey, book's got legs. I like that. So you got to be happy about that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's... You know, it, it was fun writing it. It was actually very easy. I mean, what I did was I have a, a I have a small book that's for seekers called What Does God Want? And the first third of that book is I tell what academics would refer to as salvation history as a story, you know, it, that explains and answers, you know, what, what in the world is all this about? What does God want? And so what I did was I, I thought, you know, I'm going to take that story, you know, the, the plot lines and the subplots of it and just map it to the show. And it was so easy hmm. to do because the, the, the show is, you know, I don't think that it's anything, you know, deliberately Christian, but it taps into all the major archetypes of the, you know, the supernatural epic that we identify as the Bible. And I think that it just happens providentially, which is kind of neat for me. I think, I think if, if I put one word to the show, it would be Providence, even though the show doesn't attribute anything to Providence. But as a viewer, as a Christian, as somebody who, again, knows what's going on in Scripture, it just screams, this is how life is. This is how Providence works to me. Mm. We're going to get to uh, one of the specific things that you mentioned in the book about Will Byers disappearing and what we can take away from mm-hmm. that. But but just something you just said there kind of touched on what's kind of the underlying theme to me of the book, and, and you kind of set this up early in the book, is that on a day-to-day basis, believers are very often kind of lose sight of the supernatural mm-hmm. realm. We kind of get caught up in the day-to-day and forget not only are we in a story, it's an epic story. It existed before we showed up, and it is a dramatic story with some powerful forces involved. Um, tell us a little bit about how that informed the book. Yeah, I, I think if you if you stuck a word on it, it would be Providence. If you stuck a verse on the show, it would be Genesis fifty twenty. This is the Joseph story. You know, when he, you know, his brothers know who he is and then their father dies and they're all in Egypt. Now the brothers, you know, think, oh, Joseph's going to get us now. 
And he, you know, he turns to them and says, look, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, mm. you know, to, to the salvation of, of all of us and, and a whole lot of other people. And what you see go, go on in this show is every character is sort of the product of suffering. You know, they, they all have attachment issues. You know, the, the poster child for what not to do with, you know, is Jim Hopper. I mean, he had a, a terrible, tragic loss in his life with his kid, you know, when she was five or six years old to cancer. It costs him his marriage. So he over medicates, he drinks, he womanizes. But at the end of the day, he is this thing of stone that just, you know, sort of stands in the gap between good and evil. And of course, the, 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 the girl, Eleven, we find out that she has these otherworldly powers, but she doesn't have them. She is not who she is unless she had suffered. Mm. And, and she suffers greatly in, in, in her life. You, know, you learn this about her as, as the show goes on. And every character is like that. Every character is broken in the show. And, and they, they begin to, their lives begin to intersect with this otherworldly threat that they gradually begin to realize is actually real, that there's something going on here. And so all of this stuff happens. Everything sort of concatenates together, especially in when, the, when they're up against you know, the, the supernatural evil. And they just do what they can. And things fall together because they just do what they can. And this is how life is in scripture. You know, we tend to look for the spectacular when something's, you know, spooky, spectacular. Oh, God was there. The Holy Spirit was active. Well, I got news for you. Most of the time in the Bible, you know, God is present without the spectacular. He is always interested. He's, he's moving the pieces. He's influencing people through other people or through supernatural agency. And he is the only one who sees how all the parts fit together and how they can fit together. And so, again, th this is the unseen hand, that whole theological theme of, of there's something going on behind the scenes that we cannot control. We don't worry about it. We just do our job, you know, as believers. I think there's a great metaphor for how the church should be uh, with the people who in the show who experience this alternate reality. It changes them, you know, completely. They relate to each other, all the other ones that have been touched by this reality, uh, it, it changes the way they work together, how they view each other, how they view the town, uh, you know, everything. And, and, you know, for Will, you know, Will is lost. He, he's the, the early thing that draws people in. And I begin the book by, by basically saying, look, no, you know, we're all as lost as Will Byers. Mm -hmm. We just have to come to grips with this. He is in this other reality, the upside down. And it's not a good place. It's the realm of death. It's referred to as the veil of shadows. You know, Will knows he's going to die and, and he has to somehow reach out to the people who love him. He's, he's estranged from them. I mean, look, just look at what's in operation here because of the fall. This is the easy analogy. We're all under the, the threat of death, the penalty of death. Death is inevitable. We cannot save ourselves. No one else can save us. Uh, it has to take a supernatural intervention for us to be brought back to life. You know, the, the whole theme of redemption in scripture. And, and this is how the show operates. No, Will, Will Byers is lost. He cannot save himself. He is going to die. And it takes somebody, and that turns out to be Eleven, again, in, in many cases, the least likely character in the show. She is the only one because of who she is that can deliver him. And every time that, that she uses her powers to save her friends or to try to help Will, she bleeds. I mean, I mean, what, mm. what more can you ask mm. for as, as a Christian, you know, to, to look at this show and, and look at its subtleties and how these things converge and come together and, and propel the plot. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it really just sort of screamed for some sort of Christian discussion. And that's why, you know, ultimately I, I, I wrote the book because this is the kind of show that even for pe for people who love the show and maybe they hate the church or they, they hate Jesus or, you know, for, for a dumb reason or maybe a good reason because of their suffering or they were treated bad, whatever. You can have someone who loves the show, you know, talk to them with this book or have them read the book and they will be shocked at how well they're the show they love maps over to a greater story. Hmm. And, and this, I think the book will be a great discussion starter for youth groups, parents with their kids, just anybody, again, who, who loves the show, they're going to be shocked at how well the show does this. And again, the, the punchline is unintentionally. The show itself, to me, is providence. Hmm. 
that, that they could create this show that maps so well on so many of Scripture's core themes without them even knowing it, that I think that's even worth discussion. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you mentioned uh, getting people together to talk about it, and, you know, very often with books we talk about here, Steve will say, pick it up, buy it, have a small group, and... This has got to be the easiest yes ever to go, hey, you guys want to come over, watch Netflix, watch this really awesome sci-fi horror series. Uh, There's some kind of PG-13 violence and language and a little bit of sensuality. It's nothing that's like super egregious, but it's an easy yes to get some copies of this book, get a couple of friends together just like Eric and I did this summer to watch episode three over the course of several, uh, several nights and have a really great conversation about the fact that God is telling a story with us and through us, and it's very illustrated very beautifully with this book, The World Upside, <laughs> the world Turned Upside Down, Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things. Stay with us. We'll be back. Thank you for joining us on Steve Brown, etc. We are hanging out with Dr. Michael S. Heiser. Find out more from him at drmsh.com, drmsh.com, and follow him on the Twitters at M.S. Heiser, M-S-H-E-I-S-E-R. Um, Michael, uh, I'm, I'm dating myself here, fulfilling my role as the substitute old <laughs> white guy. But uh, I, I was reminded of a book from several decades ago, uh, like The Gospel According to Peanuts. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Charles Schultz, the great cartoonist with that, uh, he was actually asked about his reaction to that book. And he said, uh, well, I, I obviously didn't intend that, but I can't deny that the messages are there. And I was wondering if you've had a chance to interact with any of the producers, writers of the show, and what their reaction is to your book. No, I, I haven't, but I would, I'd certainly be interested in getting, you know, their reaction just to see what they would, uh, would say. Um, so unfortunately, no, I don't have a good anecdote for that. Hmm. <laughs> nice. All right, I want to know, do you have a chapter on Barb? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Does Barb get Who? a chapter? It was, but it was deleted, edited oh, out. Oh, man. That's man. the best question ever. I, Thank I you, Zach. I loved Barb. I loved Barb, and Barb she was is... she was taken from us too soon. Too soon. <laughs> she, 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 gets, she gets a mention, but that's okay. just for Barb. Well, that, that <laughs> seems fitting. That's, that is that's apt. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, my serious question is, is more having to do with uh, how the story – how they deal with evil and, and kind of how evil presents itself in the story and what we can kind of look at that from from maybe a Christian perspective is what they're saying about, about evil. Yeah, I, I really actually appreciate the way they do this because uh, my, my other books, you know, and they've sold, you know, quite well, Unseen Realm and Supernatural, which is a light version of Unseen Realm. Um, I think what Christians think they know about angels and demons tends to be very superficial and, and really doesn't have a whole lot of attachment to the biblical text. The show actually, I think, has better insights in, in some respects in, in this than, than you know, what you'd get normally in church. And the, what, what the show does is initially, you know, you have this other reality and then there's this creature, you know, in, in the first season, the Demogorgon. OK, so that the, it's sort of a metaphor for, for death, really. Um, trying to devour will, it's hunting will and, you know, hunting other people as well. And then the second season, you get like mini versions of the Demogorgon. You know, you get the, the demo dogs, as Dustin refers to them. And, and you also get introduced to the main evil figure uh, that they name the Mind Flayer or the Shadow. 
And that's the Satan figure in the show. And, and, and the, the Mind Flayer becomes very prominent in, in season three. But collectively, they function as one. They function as a, as a hive mind. So that, I think, is an important insight. And, and the other important insight is, yes, the show, because it uses, it repurposes, you know, lots of horror movies in specific scenes, which is kind of one of its trademarks, you know, to repurpose 80s, you know, movies in, in, in their own scenes in the show. So you have this grotesque Hollywood kind of portrayal of evil, you know, where there's this creature and monsterly stuff. But what's more subtle is the way that the hive mind manipulates people. I think that's really significant. And it's also significant because the hive mind uh, really is a great metaphor for how the Bible portrays the powers of darkness in, in this way. I often get questions like, well, you know, how in the world, you know, how do they do the do the demons think they can win or you know what what are we supposed to do against you know supernatural evil you know and blah 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 you know but there's this fear of the demonic and the principalities and powers you know and and, and I think the hive mind is great because what it is is also its greatest weakness okay by definition it 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 knows everything within the collective if it sees one of the characters do something, if it knows where Will is or one of the other people, it never forgets. It learns and never forgets, and it reacts in unison, all of its entities, all of its members. But it cannot process, it cannot anticipate thinking and actions outside the collective. And this is really important. It's a closed system. So it, it really illustrates well how believers can do things that intelligent evil does not know. It can learn and it will never forget. But there is a sense that, that human you know, freedom, free will, free will agents and God you know, interacting with uh, believers you know, through his spirit and you know, angels or whatnot, that they do operate independently. There is a greater intelligence on both sides, but the greatest intelligence is the one on the good side, you know, God's side. And as, as powerful and as intelligent as evil is, it is limited, okay? It cannot think outside its own collective. God is always one step ahead. The church is always one step down the road. Um, you know, the, the church really does and can take the offensive against intelligent evil. If we would just be mindful that God is interested and active on a moment by moment basis, instead of just the spectacular, it would really, I think, change the way we think about our mission in, in a number of respects. That's beautiful. Well said. A dog on a chain is an illustration that I've heard uh, before. I like that. But certainly when you watch this series, you think about the phrase, steal, kill, destroy. You're like, right, this is not mm -hmm. like it, but it's kind of a personification of that idea. And it's scary. It's something to kind of keep in mind that that's what we're up against, but we're not up against it alone. We're going to hear more from Dr. Michael S. Heiser when we come back. His book is The World Turned Upside Down, Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things. If you miss this next segment, you will get pulled into the upside down. Don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> Listening to Steve Brown, etc., and we are hanging out with Dr. Michael S. Heiser. If you like what you hear, and let's be honest, why wouldn't you? Then you got to subscribe to our weekly email. It's called Key Life Connection. It's the best of keylife.org delivered directly to your inbox. You get some exclusive and early access to content. It's uh, it's good stuff. You can't beat the price. Free. So while you're thinking about it, unless you're driving, go to keylife.org slash subscribe. Let's make that happen, and you will rise up and say, thanks, dude. You're really good at the promotion a, stuff. In a right? spiritual way. In Thank a spiritual way, <laughs> brother dude. He has a, big, he has a vested interest in, in that kind of stuff, too. <laughs> Michael, um, there are those in the Christian community who feel like um, that they should abstain from... Uh, 
the pop the whole world of the pop culture thing for what they view as potentially sin that's that's there uh, included in that what where what would you say to that given what i'm hearing you say is so so evident in a program um in a series like stranger things that has so many really really good things in it that uh they are really good things for people to obviously be able to to see and to hear and to talk about Mm -hmm. well you know, I, I think every believer needs to be, you know, honest with themselves. And, and the key word there is honest. Um, if you're weak, you know, if, if you really uh, are, are potentially stumbled, you know, by maybe seeing something violent on TV or something sexually graphic, um, then, then you ought to avoid it. That, that, that's for sure. But a lot of a lot of Christians will avoid these things sort of as a you know, as a badge of honor, you know, brownie points with God, you know, that exactly. kind of thing. So I, I, th- I think the motivation really needs it to be examined, you know, and, and honestly examined. Um, you know, if, if you are weak, you know, if, if it is a bad testimony, you know, to, you know, watch it, you know, something with graphic sex and with, with somebody that is wondering, you know, they have an idea of what a Christian is. And, and again, and you're aware of this sort of thing. Well, then, you know, by all means, don't do that. But the flip side of it is, you know, if these things aren't, you know, personal temptations to you, you know, if, if the person, you know, if, if there's no question of uh, that, this is going to sort of mar or tarnish your identity as a believer, then I think you ought to actually seriously go the other direction and, and consider how you can dip into pop culture for the sake of having conversations with people who are lost. Because let's be honest, you know, you, you watch a show and it has, you know, cuss words in it. Well, so, you know, your neighbor probably uses those too. I don't talk you know, to him either. The, another, <laughs> right. Yes, that, you that, that, that's the time. whole point. That's the whole point. The, the, you know, God has placed you, you know, in this person's life for a very specific reason. And if you have to wonder what that reason is, well, then you've got some spiritual problems of your own. I mean, there is this thing called the Great Commission. We are placed in the lives of people for, for the specific purpose of bringing them back into the family of God. And so, you know, the, there are a lot of things that can bridge you know, the gap between you and them, and that can facilitate a a really meaningful conversation uh, with, you know, people, with your neighbor. And so I think pop culture is one of the things that really uh, can bridge those sorts of gaps, you know, and and Christians, you know, I think hearing that would say, well, of course, I want my neighbor, you know, to come to the Lord and whatnot. Well, okay, you don't cut yourself off from your neighbor. And maybe you can find ways, again, using pop culture to you know, really even spend more time or better time, you know, with your neighbor, then you should do those things. They become tools. Hmm. Uh, the other question I often get is, well, uh, you know, look, they're playing Dungeons and Dragons in the first scene and it's got all these occult, you know, themes and it's magic and it's super telekinetic powers and whatnot. It's like, look, you know, we have this in Narnia, the Narnia Chronicles, right. we right. have it in the Lord of the Rings, you know, and, and, and those are, are held up and rightly so as really significant Christian cultural works. And the reason that they're, they're held up and ought to be is because they don't blur the line between good and evil. And frankly, neither do stranger things. Uh, there's, a, there's a clear line of good and evil. There's a cost to power that's wielded, you know, even, you know, with 11, you know, with, with the use of, of abilities. Um, the, the, there's no ambiguity created in the show between, you know, that, that would confuse a viewer as to what side do I want to be on? Right. That doesn't glorify you know, the evil. There, there's the no seduction. There's no seductive quality right. to the upside down, to the dark side, to, to, to the mind flare. I mean, there's nothing like that in the show. And I, I think you know, on that point, especially, it's very analogous to the Chronicles of Narnia, to the Lord of the Rings, all that stuff that's going on that Christians, you know, sort of flock to and use to have conversations with people who are not believers. I think this goes in that bucket Hmm. uh, for these very obvious reasons. So I I understand again, the, the impulse. I mean, I, you know, pop culture to me is not an open gate either. There are things I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't watch, but there are a lot of things that I think that we, if we, when we cut ourselves off from these things, it really impedes us in, in, in many respects, to having the kinds of conversations with lost people that we really need to have. And we're supposed to have, we're commanded to have, 
Yeah. You know, it has to go beyond just inviting somebody to a Bible study or to church. You know, you people have to interact with with you as a believer, as a normal person. That's awesome. That that there has to be engagement on on just a normal level for people to not be suspicious of you uh, and and be open, you know, to open themselves to you. And this and pop culture is one of the ways to do that. That's great. I, I came across a quote yesterday that it was not talking about Christianity, it's talking about sales. And it was saying a sale is not something you pursue. Sale is something that just happens when you're in the pursuit of serving your customers. And it's not a perfect yeah. analog, but I feel like there's something there that's like, yeah, look, let's leave, let's love others deeply with a Christ-like love. And these things are going to kind of uh, these kind of things are going to kind of happen. And pop culture is, is is kind of a common language that we can use to kind of yeah. make those conversations happen. And- and you know when when push comes to shove, your 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 lost neighbor they know that you know promiscuous sex is self destructive. They know this. Hmm. I mean, they 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 might want to want to try to hide it or deny it, but deep down they know the 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 chaos that it sows in the lives of people, you know, themselves and, and others around them. They know you know that you know drugs and you know abuse of alcohol. They they know all these things are self destructive. So, you know, if you can sort of engage with them, despite the fact that, that they're, you know, they have this, this chaos, you know, running through their lives and they know that you're there with them in some way, you're not endorsing it. You're actually there to help them and help them be honest with themselves and with what they're doing. And, and, and at the scene of a particular show helps you do that. Again, that, that's something that's very useful, you know, to, to moving them toward the gospel and toward the kingdom of God. That's beautiful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are running out of time. It was a quick, quick conversation. <laughs> I wish we had a, a another a faster another than driver's seat, didn't it? Yeah, it really is, man. Our guest is Michael S. Heiser. His book is "The World Turned Upside Down: Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things." I hope it will facilitate some new and cool and exciting conversations with your friends, both believers and non-believers. Hopefully, maybe it even gives you a new kind of lens to see pop culture through that the gospel kind of can exist in different kind of ways throughout a lot of different stories. We will be back in just a few minutes to let you know who we were going to have on next week. It's kind of an interesting person. I think you're going to be interested in finding that out. We'll be back soon. Thank you for joining us, and we will talk to you on the other side. Listening to Steve Brown, etc., and we're about to land this plane. There you go. <laughs> so we were talking about Stranger Things and the lessons that can be learned from it. But I think the larger thing that I'm hearing is the power of story and mm. powers. The, the, the powers. The story reminds us of things. Stories give us context. Jesus understood uh, the power of story with his parables. Uh, Zach has uh, several amazing series that he's taught on those. You really should go to keylife.org and check those out. Um, there's a great quote. I've seen it attributed to G.K. Chesterton or a Scottish writer, Bruce Marshall. The young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to go, yeah, uh, clearly he's looking for the right thing in the wrong way. But I think it has even broader implications because I would say anybody who watches the movie and they and they they're like pump their fist when the flawed hero finds redemption, they're looking for God. If you've got these characters who have been estranged and then they're finally reconciled and it's really moving, you're looking for God. If you have the final scene where triumph or good finally triumphs over evil, well, you're looking for God, even if you don't realize it. In Acts, Paul was speaking to the council in Athens, and he goes, oh, I noticed that you're very religious, and I saw your shrines and your altars to the unknown God. It's so interesting that he doesn't call them stupid, and he doesn't act like those stories don't exist. He acknowledges it and uses it to point it towards the real truth. So I I think that if we are smart, 
we will take a lesson from that. Because if we miss people's stories, then we miss people. So, Kathy, next week, tell us a story about who we have on the shoe. The shoe. Next week, we're going to tackle the subject of forgiveness um, with a lady who really is uh, pretty well equipped to talk about forgiveness, and that's Ruth Graham. Uh, the daughter of Billy and Ruth Graham. And if you're not familiar with her story, she's she's got a good one. Talk about the prodigal child. Um, but anyway, she's written a new book, and it's titled Forgiving My Father, Forgiving Myself, um, An Invitation to the Miracle of Forgiveness. Um, I think it's going to be a really good program, mm. really good program. I love that you guys have a connection to Billy Graham. That's, I mean, I would drop that. I would just drop that into any conversation possible, <laughs> relevant or not. And you're like, that reminds me of what uh, Billy Graham said. When Kathy, I are you going to host that show? <laughs> no, 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 no. But I will be here. You could host. You could totally do it. No. This no, look. No, no. If Matthew's this, if on this, a roll. No, Matt, if this Matt. rodeo clown can can do this. All bets are off. Yeah. But hey, tradition. I think we should say Matthew did a good job, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's yeah. have some applause. Good job. First, applause. I look forward to your positive Yelp review. Thank you so much. <laughs> if only we had a producer to bring up some ah, applause. Oh, my goodness. That's all the time we have, babies. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. I Oh, I forgot to write a catchphrase. Ah. Uh, oh, well. I don't have a catchphrase. Next time. See you next time, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.